on this week's show, how to play your PS2 games on your new Xbox. One of the worst games ever made gets a remaster. And we look back at our favourite guests of the year. This week's show is brought to you by our very good friends at Bitmap Books and their new Game Boy The Box Art Collection that we'll tell you more about very soon. And keep listening for an amazing offer on Retro Gamer Magazine. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 254, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And that was the year 2020. An interesting year all round. I think you'll agree, boys. I'm, I'm surprised we're still here. <laughs> um, and, and you know what? When, when this kind of chaos started happening in 2020, we were really worried about the podcast and if it was going to continue and actually i think we've continued and we've grown in strength and this year we've actually looking back and picking some of our favorite guests and i'll tell you what the selection of guests this year i've I've been really struggling to try and get all the good guests in there i was gonna say i think you know we probably say this every single year when we do this episode but genuinely i know 2020 has been really hard on a lot of people but we're really lucky that i think 2020 has probably been the best year for the retro hour um, and it is thanks to every, all our listeners, you know, and supporters and stuff. But honestly, some some of the guests we've managed to get on this year, it's been a bit of like a blessing in disguise, probably because they're bored at home, not doing a lot. Yeah. So, but yeah, <laughs> yeah man, we've like, filled a lot of gaps, haven't we? Yeah, definitely. Definitely filled a lot of gaps. And it's amazing when you just get Ravi to just kind of like poke them with a stick on Twitter. And they just say yes. <laughs> over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll give it but eventually. <laughs> <laughs> but this is our annual retrospective of the year. Now, we do this. We're kind of into our Christmas programming now for the next couple of weeks. Um, this week, we're going to be doing our usual news roundup of the last seven days. And then, rather than doing an interview this week, we're going to be doing a look back on our favourite guests of 2020. And like you said, I think because, I mean, it, it has been a really interesting year in terms of guests that we've had on the show because we've actually had a few that we've wanted on this podcast since we started doing it five years ago. You know, people like Dominic Diamond and RJ Michael that are people that we've, we've always wanted on this show. But like you said, Ravi and Joe, the fact that this year everyone's been working from home because normally we try these guys and they're like, oh, I would do it, but I'm flying off to wherever this week and maybe want to get back. But I think it has been obviously a complete change of everyone's life but even looking at when we entered into the pandemic back in March I mean you know start of the year us guys were all together then all of a sudden we were forced into recording remotely and mm. that was a real shock to the system you know the first time ever that we hadn't been in a room together and figuring out that technology and the systems for recording as we went along that was all completely new to us and even people listening, I think one of the big things that we found you know, at, the, at the end of March, we actually had quite a big drop off of listeners because people generally listened on their morning commute in the car or on the train or maybe on their lunch hour when they're out shopping. But then after a month or two, not only did those numbers come back, but actually now year on year, we've got the biggest audience this podcast has ever had. So it's been a really bizarre year. And do you know what? I get loads of people that contact me and... And they're like, oh, Ravi, I haven't listened to the latest episode. I haven't listened to this one. And I'm like, you don't have to listen to every single episode every <laughs> every time. But this episode is really good for discovering ones in our back catalogue of this year that, you know, are really significant. And you can hear a little clip and why we really like it if you, if you haven't dived into that story yourself. Yeah, and obviously we'll link up in the show notes to the uh, full episodes. If you know you get a bit of a teaser of it and you want to hear the entire thing, they'll all be in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, it is our final normal episode of the year. Next week, it's going to be the Retro Hour annual Christmas Super Quiz that I know you guys always look really forward to. You're always really excited about getting your knowledge of retro games tested. Um, I, <laughs> I don't even know training. what to say. I've been, been training. Calm your I've, excitement down, Joe. I've been training. So we've got, we're recording this one night we on. It's Wednesday night right now and we're doing it on Sunday night. And interestingly, yeah. one of my best friends is a bathroom fitter 
and he's coming to fit my new bathroom at the weekend and he is like the oracle of retro games so like i'm helping him fit the bathroom and i'm just gonna be like studying like i'm gonna get him to ask me questions and i'm gonna ask him questions and stuff like that <laughs> because of this year we've got, we're having to do it a little bit different so we've got no teams it's every man for himself and i can't come last i can't <laughs> You know, it's crazy how seriously we take this quiz, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just a bit of fun, boys. <laughs> Never. Yeah. I, I'm going to beat you all this week. <laughs> well, Ravi, it, you, you're due a win, surely. What yeah, is it, three yeah. years on the bounce now that you've lost? Four that's years? That's it, that's it. Uh, Dan's going to be sneaking me some questions. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be all legit. Yeah, no Googling, guys. Now, we have got um, Paul Drury from Retro Gamer Magazine is going to be joining us, um, as always. And also, uh, Neil from RMC is going to be, um, for the first time, joining us on the quiz as well next week. Yeah, he's also been messaging me going, I'm rubbish. So, <laughs> <laughs> let's see what happens. And, of course, you can play along at home as well. So, uh, yeah, the next show is going to be the Retro Hour Annual Christmas Super Quiz. It's always a bit of a giggle, our little Christmas special. But before that, we have got some news stories to get through, our final news roundup of the year. We'll get into that in just a minute. Before we do, um, just something that we'd love you to check out. Now, of course, the Retro Hour podcast is made possible by our incredible supporters. And we really appreciate it when you show our sponsors a bit of love as well, because we only pick the best ones that are out there, including our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, I think it's fair to say we're all big fans of the Game Boy. Absolutely love the Game Boy. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Game Boy. Uh, really nice. I've got a Game Boy Advance with a back, backlit screen as well, so yeah. Well, the Game Boy, obviously the console that really kick-started the handheld gaming revolution. And at Bitmap Books have got a new book coming out soon called The Box Art Collection, which is all about those incredible small cover artwork for this monochrome marvel. Now, there's so many games. I mean, you think of the franchises that were on the Game Boy, some of the most famous in the video games industry, Mario, Zelda, Donkey Kong, Metroid, Mega Man, Castlevania, Final Fantasy. And a lot of those games hold up really well by modern standards for handheld games. So not only have they worked with some of the world's most renowned Game Boy collectors, but they've put together a really varied selection of titles that span both the Western and the Eastern tastes as well. Because, I mean, you always found that kind of disconnect back in the day that the Japanese market in particular was very different to the European and American market. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, real talk now, I've had my hands on these books by Bitmap Books before, mm. and the quality of these books is absolutely amazing if you've got your auntie or even your mum in my case struggling to figure out what they want to buy for you for your christmas present or something you don't want to end up with one of those you know b&m bargains little handheld 10 pound controllers <laughs> you want to get one of these books they're absolutely amazing honestly go out there have a look on the website the quality of these books i cannot praise them enough and this is 372 pages long. And there's also special editions as well. And like, the, you know, there's a metallic silver textured cover with a metallic blue foil logo on there as well. There's also collector's editions in silver and gold with exclusive cover illustrations from Superplay and rare legend Will Overton. You also get an A2 poster in there as well, a metal box. Now, these are strictly limited in numbers, but you can pre-order your copy right now at bitmapbooks.co.uk and show a bit of love to our incredible friends bitmap books now let's get straight into the stories this week actually on the nintendo theme a game that i don't know if you guys have ever played have you played the zelda games that came out on the philips cdi i haven't but obviously very familiar with them uh probably <laughs> because of the angry video game nerd about 10 years ago but yeah this is really interesting so a cdi developer member fanboy called dopley i believe his name is has uh, developed a reimagined versions of Link, the Faces of Evil, and Zelda, the Wand of Gamelon, um, which I think is really interesting, which are available for you to play on PC, you know, for free, which I think is fantastic. But I've been reading this article, so just to get my head around this, he hasn't just, like, slapped them on, you know, on the internet for emulation for you just to play or anything like that. From what I understand, he's rebuilt these games from the ground up for them to run kind of like on modern technology, like they play with widescreen. He's kind of like, you know, he's smoothed out some of the sprites and just made it look a lot nicer. Um, he's cleared up some of the audio as well. Um, and he's also put some of the subtitles in for the awful, awful clips as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is a real, real labour of love. So it's such a terrible game. Apparently it took him four years to do this. That is commitment, mm. I think. 
I mean, these games, for people that are not aware of them, um, obviously the Philips CDI was a project in the early 90s. Mm. I believe Philips, I, I want to say they lost a billion dollars at least, maybe five, <laughs> lost a hell of a lot of money on this project. And it was meant to be that that technology that every company in the early 90s thought that we wanted, but no one actually did. And that was the living room multimedia set-top box. So the Xbox One. <laughs> Pretty much what the Xbox One became, yeah. yeah. I mean, technology wasn't ready for it no. then. I mean, they kind of went from running encyclopedias and mm -hmm. photo CDs and that kind of thing. But also, they were working in partnership with Nintendo at the time. Mm -hmm. So I believe, I mean, you know, the story's quite convoluted and long-winded, but... We, we know how the PlayStation came out of Sony's partnership with Nintendo. Philips was another partner that they were going to work with on a CD-ROM drive that never materialised. But in return for their technology, Nintendo let them licence a couple of their franchises. So we got these they really bad multimedia games for the Philips CDI based on Zelda, and Mario was another one as well. They yeah, didn't Hotel have Mario. the... Um quality seal of Nintendo, did they? Do no, <laughs> they, they did not. And I, I, I don't know how they like got away with it, really. Like, did Nintendo not get to see these games before they came out? Did they not get to quality check them or something? Or did they just kind of come out and Nintendo just sat there and just kind of like, you know, palm, you know, facing palms and just went, oh my God, what is this? And was this the actual name of it? The Faces of Evil? I thought yeah. that was like a meme or like, no. uh, you know, people refer to it as the Faces of Evil. No, no. So, there so was, badly drawn. So, so there was three of them. So there's the Faces of Evil. Um, the Wand of Gamelon and then there was also The Adventures of Zelda but he's not done that one uh, he's not remastered that one apparently he, uh, there's been some issues with him trying to get the sprites to work and stuff like that but he's thinking about doing that and Hotel Mario because he's a little bit more experienced now because like I say he spent four years on this but yeah the Faces of Evil it's not a meme it's a real thing <laughs> it's a real game from 1993 <laughs> so, so do you think Nintendo are like really aggressive like they are with everybody they sue everybody for everything do you think they'd be bothered about these assets being remastered i, was, I literally was about to say i wonder if the classic cease and desist you know uh, lands on his doorstep in the next couple of days but i don't know whether they can because it's cdi like i don't it know how Philips, it worked with the licensing because so, yeah. it wasn't because nintendo just kind of said yeah use the license do you know what i mean so it's a bit of a strange one because it's owned by cdi Technically, well, actually, these the links in the article that I'll put in mm. in our show notes on um, cdi.blogspot.com. The links to the download have already gone. Okay, so this this was on a Google Drive and it's been removed. Okay. Whether that was you know a letters come through from Nintendo or whatever, um, but actually the the link on archive.org it is backed up there at the moment, and I, I don't think it's the guy that made them, but someone in the comments has uploaded it onto archive.org. Yeah, the so mega the mega link's gone as well. Yeah, they've all been taken down. So whether, you know, it might have just been a case of this was getting a bit of a publicity around it and the guy got a bit nervous about it. But I mean, yeah, a lot of people have been saying Nintendo can't do anything because it was a Philips product, mm. but Nintendo do still own the rights to Zelda, I imagine. It is still their, one of their trademarks. Yeah, that's very, that's a good point. And they could say, you know, you're using our, you know, our person what's the word i can't i don't know the official word i'm tired but they're using our asset you're using our character yeah. kind of thing so yeah maybe maybe uh they are breathing down his neck or like you say it's just because it's got a bit of traction he's got a bit nervous but like you say it, it's gonna stay on the internet forever now somebody's yeah. gonna keep posting the, the, the it. torrent's still working so. mm. <laughs> <laughs> i mean this is a nintendo who take down youtube videos for showing their new games and advertising them for free so um <laughs> Nothing would surprise me. But, I mean, if you want to play these, they're, they're actually playable on Windows and Linux as well. So, I mean, you don't need a CDI if you want to experience them. And I think there will be a lot of interest out there because I've been seeing quite a bit of activity on Twitter. People who were always a little bit curious about these kind of really bad Zelda games mm. that came out on the CDI that, you know, apart from watching AVGN videos and stuff, they've never had the chance to play them before. So I think, obviously, this guy's kind of touched them up a little bit and made them the best versions of what they could be. But I think if you do want to, you know, if you're a big Zelda fan and that's kind of the the missing game in the library that you've never played before, it is a really good way of experiencing it. Uh, and you don't have a CDI lying around, so you can just boot it up on Windows or Linux. I was well, doesn't everyone have a CDI in the attic? I, I was going <laughs> to say, they're not, they're not cheap games and it's not a cheap console to get a hold of, is yeah. it? So, You know, I got my CDI for 25 quid. I hate you. I actually hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I googled Philips CD player 
and um, it had the full motion video cartridge and everything, probably about eight, nine years ago now. Um, so, yeah, you don't normally get them for that price anymore. Though, no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ravi, you've been looking at um, a classic Mac. Yeah, this is really interesting, actually. So um, this is a Macintosh classic prototype. So, you know, the original Macintosh, but it's surfaced on Twitter and this is actually transparent. And, you know, looking at this, it's got the CRT built in, like, you know, it's based on the old Macintosh, but um, all the internals are the same. But you can actually see inside. And I was thinking, like, you remember when Johnny Ive joined Apple and uh, in 1998 they released the iMacs and the iMacs were these CRTs with a clear back and a Mm -hmm. clear kind of side. This really like reminds me of that but also some people are saying maybe it was just used for engineering so like engineers could look inside the Mac and see kind of what was going on but I think these would make really interesting cases if someone was to kind of print these or or make transparent replacement cases for the uh, original Macintosh. It'd be lovely. I really like the design of it. Other than it says made in Singapore backwards um, on the inside of it. It looks (laughs) pretty neat. It's all good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, actually, you make an interesting point there about, I do kind of feel like there was that era where transparent electronics were like the the real in thing weren't they i remember having like a a transparent house phone in my room like back in around 2000 2001 yeah the transparent n64s the game boys well, weren't it was, they it digital was all the cameras as well yeah or, the digital yeah. cameras as well yeah definitely and for a company like apple who especially today kind of try to hide everything away. I mean, you know, they don't want you going inside and kind of seeing how the magic works. The fact that Apple actually made these computers where you could actually look inside it. I remember like um, a friend of mine ha- had the one of the last Apple CRT displays and it had a completely transparent back mm. and you could see everything happening in there. So that was quite unusual actually that Apple did that in hindsight because they've always been so, you know, make it look like a a work of art or something, not like a machine. And the weird thing is as well, it's got the Apple logo on it. So like, obviously they've put some effort in there to get the coloured logo on there. And it's a kind of official thing rather than like a third party case or just one that they were using for prototypes. Or maybe they just had a little sticker and stuck it on the front. But I mean, yeah, looking at the comments here, apparently it is quite common that during the prototyping phases of a product, what they'll do is do a transparent case so they can see how it all fits together and also to check where the airflow goes. They put smoke in apparently to see where it travels. So um, it is quite a common thing. But looking at that though, it just made me think, imagine having like a, a completely transparent iPhone. That I was you've literally just stole the words out of my mouth. I was about to say you wouldn't see a, a transparent iPhone uh, tw- 12 these days, would you? So But you know for, for people like me who was the kid that would take everything to bits to see how it worked and then, you know, could never get the video recorder put back together properly after I'd done that. <laughs> Having these, you know, it, it kind of really satisfied that curiosity. You know, I didn't have to take it a bit. Well, well also it over. helps that, like, the Apple was kind of a bit of a premium product. If you had, like, yeah. a Spectrum or something and you were looking inside there, you probably want to hide it <laughs> or, you know, uh, something using cheaper components. So, yeah, it does look beautiful. If you want to get a look at that, I'll put that and um, all the stories we talk about this week, like we do every week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. You might want to also check out this um, English localization prototype of Final Fantasy on the NES. Now, this is a prototype they found, which is not like the version that we got released in the West back in 1990. This is actually a version that they they were working on during the initial translation phases then, and actually there's quite a few differences in here. Yeah, I was looking at this article earlier on. So the original Final Fantasy games are kind of like the first four, maybe even like six of them or something like that. Obviously, we only got three of them in the West, but yeah. they are you know famous for having really bad localization, and really localization wasn't really a thing back in 1990 um but yeah this has been posted on the hidden palace uh twitter feed twitter page um but interestingly is the localization on the prototype version is apparently even worse than what we actually ended up with in the end Um, i I love this one here who want to learn the spell who want to learn the spell i love it (laughs) um 
it's just I don't know it's I think I guess what they do is when they kind of go from Japanese to English is they just do like a word for word translation I guess and it just doesn't quite work out and obviously they've realized over the years I think the same thing happened with the original Resident Evil as well it just just doesn't quite kind of sound right when it kind of comes over to the you know to the UK and over to America and stuff um but yeah this is really interesting I'd love to know how they've managed to get a hold of us where this has come from yeah, because they don't reveal that in this yeah. article. It's just a few screenshots. And I mean, there's another one here. No one touches my princess, light warriors, you impertinent guys. <laughs> I gal and will knock you all down in a minute. So, I mean, I, we've talked about this on the show before, these really bad Japanese translations in video games of that era. I mean, there were actually worse examples of this that we've talked about in the past. I got Your base will are belong to us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I just, I mean, the famous line is, I Garland will knock you all down. But in the prototype, yeah. it's, I Garland will knock you all down in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like, why is there an in a minute on the end there? I, I love the you, you impertinent guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my days. Well, at least it's a lot. I mean, I say it's a lot better now. I know some people still complain about the Final Fantasy games, but at least localization is kind of, you know, pretty solid now in modern gaming. You got to remember back then. I mean, obviously, 1990. It was long before the days of like you know Google Translate, mm. or you know if they want to do translation, then I guess they would physically have to hire someone who spoke Japanese and American, and probably sit with both developers and or, or at least one side of them, and actually do the translation I, in real time. You see, I I think I don't feel like they even did that. I feel like they they hired somebody and just kind of got them to just translate it like i don't think they sat down with like both parties or anything or sat down to try and like understand you know like what's actually happening in that m- very moment in that kind of cut scene or you know what's happening in the game at that point i think they literally just got a translator to just translate them <laughs> word for word and it just that's why it comes out so you know broken you know because <laughs> of just like the way the way they speak and stuff like that it's just it's just doesn't it's just gibberish really like i'm being right now <laughs> But it gives us all a giggle all these years later. Yeah, absolutely. Least, so. And it's always interesting when these like world famous games surface, like the prototypes of them and stuff like that. And they're there available for us to all kind of look at on the internet and stuff. Yeah, if your memory's not that sharp on the actual translations, they've uh, quite handily actually made a page with all of the, the versions that we got in the game and the versions that are in this prototype so you can compare the phrases as well, and which it, is uh, quite cool. It totally messes up all the timelines as well. <laughs> Which, because uh, I know that there's one US timeline as well as a Japanese timeline. Oh, well, with, with the, uh, fan, with the first Fantasy, six Final Fantasy yeah. games. Yeah, yeah, there is. It's a right mess that is. Also, also very famous. <laughs> and apparently they, um, you know, you know, stuff like there's explicit death references and religion and stuff mentioned in here as well. That obviously Nintendo of America back then were really into that family-friendly image that were taken out of the Western releases. Yeah, it always made me laugh in like, you know, early '90s games and stuff, where it, like in the Japanese version, it's just straight up "you're dead." But in the yeah. uh, you know the Western version, it would be like they have been destroyed or they are no more. <laughs> you're having a nice nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Japan, you're straight up dead. They're dead. They've been blown away. <laughs> no mess at all. Yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I, I always love it when prototype. I mean, even just getting a glimpse into such a, a legendary franchise, just kind of seeing the roots of it and you know, kind of tracing that development history. I think that that's always interesting to see as well. Now, let's talk about cyberpunk games. I mean, I, I've always been quite a big fan of cyberpunk. And this is an interesting article on Eurogamer charting a brief history of cyberpunk games. Yeah, I, w- I was thinking the other day, do the youths know cyberpunk? Like, they might have seen <laughs> the new Blade Runner remastered. Um, you know, but that... There's not that many cyberpunk things around. And, uh, of course, with the release of Cyberpunk 2077, there's a lot of hype bet- behind it, a lot of hype behind the genre. But I, I love this article because it's talking about a lot of games that I absolutely love when I was a kid. So um, Degenerations one. I um, mm-hmm. love that game. Yeah, they talk about Max Headroom as well. Of course, Beneath a Steel Sky, which was a huge cyberpunk title. But my favourite game... Of all time, Sean Cooper, I'd love you to come on the podcast, um, is Syndicate. And, Mm. uh, you know, that's, for me, that changed everything. That was a fantastic game. And the whole cyberpunk atmosphere was uh, really amazing. And then they're going into, like, Deus Ex. 
yeah, as that's, well. That's when you start to kind of get to my generation. I was reading this feed as well, and it's interesting because if you're like, oh yeah, Cyberpunk 77, and then you look at this article and it's like, I can't remember other than the Deus Ex games, any other kind of like recent or modern, and even then they're not that recent, cyberpunk games like of the genre. So like you say, I don't think many, you know, younger the younger generation will be familiar with the genre. It's good that it's going to be such an immersive world and stuff. And it's like, you know, there's there's these kind of VR ones and these images of the future, like Watchdog, um, mm. Watchdogs at the moment. But Cyberpunk's something totally different. And also, it's something so 90s, isn't it? It's like the yeah. ultimate 90s genre, Cyberpunk. There's something tremendously 90s about it and something very... Keanu Reeves about it which is really iron- ironic because they've obviously got him like playing one of the main characters in the game like I just associate him with so many cyberpunk films like The Matrix and is it Johnny Johnny Me- Meonic or something from the 90s as well uh, well, well, well they were also saying that G-Police um, yeah. on the Playstation was a, another huge kind of cyberpunk game and it did get into that like Playstation era as well but it's it's just great to see it kind of coming back and I hope this is a a decent game and loads of kids start going around in leather jackets and uh, with weird haircuts and uh, busting safety out co- pins hanging off them. And, busting uh, out copies of Syndicate and Shadowrunner. Yeah, and <laughs> inserting <laughs> chips in their neck and uh, yeah. <laughs> using Persuadatrons. You know, you know, to me, like cyberpunks, like, you know, the, the cast of hackers. Yeah. When they're all on the, the cool skateboards and, the, you know, like you said, those crazy hairdos and... You used to look at those, you know, when you watch those movies and you're like, those, they, they're the coolest guys ever. I want to be like them. Have you ever been to Cyberdog, the shop? No. No. Okay, Cyberdog is like, if you're a raver okay. and you have all the kind of cyber, cyber goth style, uh, you go there and it's literally like a nightclub in London. You go in there, they've got a big sound system. They've got someone dancing on the table. They're all dressed as cyberpunks. They've got like chipboards as their clipboards um you know you could buy clothes with microchips on them and stuff it's absolutely amazing it's like entering <laughs> another world so i recommend uh going to the cyber dog store um to anybody yeah just just for the experience i'm nowhere near cool enough to go yeah to i'm not that terrifying <laughs> i'd walk in and just be like scared i'd be like oh my god <laughs> like, feeling like go, an go old woman <laughs> and check it out mate it's amazing Walking in my next hoodie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all UV as well, so it's <laughs> mad. I, I lo- I've always loved the idea of cyberpunk, though, and I remember, weirdly, because I'm not really into um, Japanese animation, like anime, but I remember watching, I don't know if you guys have ever seen something called um, Serial Experiments Lane. No, I've not heard. I thought you were going to say something really like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Akira or something like that. No, well, this was, I mean, it's probably the only anime I actually watched from start to finish and it gets really weird, but it, it was it was on about 1998, 99, and it's all about... Um, a girl whose friend dies from memory and it's all set in like she goes to this like cyber nightclub in japan right and everyone there's kind of like you know they all hook into this thing called the wired which is you know essentially the internet and they have like two separate lives and uh yeah i remember this scene of a guy going down the street with essentially like a a version of um google glass and he's a bit like an android you know he's watching screens in his eyes as he walks down the road and i remember watching that you know as a teenager and thinking that's going to be the future and how cool it looked and obviously now looking back it looks quite naff but I've always kind of liked that idea of um you know combining the real world with like cyberpunk culture and that kind of thing yeah definitely so what what was that show called I've never heard of it um serial experiments lane serial experiments lane yeah, no, it up. it's probably all on youtube I don't know that one no yeah. that's interesting that is it, it got a bit weird later on I think like it turns out that you know no spoilers, it's, it's been out 22 years. Uh, but I think, like, God is the internet. Oh, okay. Or something, or he Fair enough. The internet. I, I've it, just it, sent it, you pictures of Cyberdog as well, guys, <laughs> which is like, that is just the game, isn't it? It is. It, it looks very Matrix-esque. Like, kind of, like, actually reminded me of the Zion scenes in the Matrix when they're out of the Matrix, funny enough. But yeah, very, very cyberpunk ap- apocalyptic. Even like Degeneration. Yeah. You know, I played that again not long ago, probably about two years back I played it. And there is something about that game. I mean, it's really atmospheric. And the fact that it's set in this kind of futuristic tower block and everything's kind of glowing neon. And the fact that it's set in the middle of the night. I mean, that that was a... I think those cyberpunk games have often got a really strong atmosphere and really draw you in, I think. 
And they, they've also kind of got like like the sound in degeneration. I love it. It's just mm. sound effects. It's really, really kind of clear. And uh, there's always a door going, vroom, isn't there, yeah. in <laughs> cyberpunk <laughs> games. Now, before we get into our best bits of 2020, there have actually been some highlights of this year, believe it or not. We'll get into those in just a minute. A story that we, in fact, should have mentioned a couple of weeks ago, but <laughs> we just keep forgetting to do it. But this is very good friend of the show, Modern Vintage Gamer, who's been doing a series of videos all about emulating retro systems on the new Xbox X platform. And it seems like this has been picked up by so many big news websites, especially now that he's got a video demonstrating running PlayStation 2 games on the Xbox X. Yeah, this looks really interesting. I've, I've been hearing about this and um, it seems that you can run like uh, RetroArch and uh, quite a few emulators. So it's not just limited to the PS2, you know, RetroArch is really multi-platform. And um, the way that you actually do this is by enabling developer mode. To enable developer mode, you actually like register as an individual and pay 19 US dollars. And then your Xbox is actually actually able to load other stuff onto that. And essentially, if you think about it, it's it's a PC, isn't it? And yeah. what you're doing is you're just saying, get us out of this like little walled garden bit and uh, let us run some emulators. And I think this can really grow because it's not, like an option, like, you know, when you had um, operating systems on the um, PlayStation and they got turned off and then everything got ruined. I think that they're going to leave this open, this developer mode, and uh, kind of have the idea that anything runs on the Xbox, which is a really nice idea. I was going to say what I find really interesting about the whole thing, which I think like you could see as like a little bit of an oversight is that like Microsoft haven't turned around and said, there's a hell of a lot of people all of a sudden who are developers signing up for this. Like, paying, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm guessing it doesn't get, you know, um, screened or anything like that. It's just an automatic thing. You know, you, you, you sign up for it, you pay it and then it unlocks that mode or something. Well, yeah, you can sign up as a company yeah. or as an individual. So I guess just as the individual, um, and it says develop and sell apps, add-ins and services as an individual student or unincorporated group. So I guess it's, you know, uh, pretty open, that is, individual. Yeah, maybe they were expecting people to have a play around with it and stuff like that. Because like you say, it's essentially a PC. So maybe they were mm. expecting this. I think the problem's going to come when someone inevitably develops some kind of cracking or some kind of way of playing the games without protection or side loading them onto it or something. And that's when it's going to become an issue. But I think at the moment yeah. running RetroArch um, seems to be fine. I mean, I think the Xbox X, by the looks of this, I mean, from what I understand, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in Xbox architecture, but they run kind of a cut down version of Windows. But um, it looks like there is just enough Windows in there to make applications like retro RetroArch be able to run on here but i think you make a good point there ravi it's when when you have this amount of the system open to people to kind of get in there they often do puncture holes in that wall <laughs> and then it does lead to things that microsoft might not want people to be doing yeah and like as opposed to the ps5 which is totally locked up you know everything has to be purchased through that store and through that system it seems that the xbox one's a lot more open but as you said, that could bring risks with it as well, right? But a lot of people are saying, I mean, the headline is, you know, that the the Xbox X can now run all PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 games via RetroArch. And, you know, a lot of people are kind of saying the Xbox can do that, but the PS5 can't. And using that as like a headline. And people are quite, yeah, there's actually a couple of comments on this article here on um, VG247.com that I'll link up in our show notes. A guy here is calling Sony pathetic for not implementing more emulation I, I, I for PS1 and PS2 games. I think it's just, um, it's, it's fluid nowadays. So like, you know, Sony could just release one firmware update that would change all of that. So, you know, it, it seems a bit clickbaity kind of going, oh, they can run the emulators and you can't, you know. Who knows? They might see that as a new market uh, uh, kind of emerging and do their own own thing with that. You know, um, all of these consoles, they're receiving tons of updates at the moment. Um, both of them. So we never know what's, what the state's going to be in, like, you know, six months. 
And I think also, I mean, it, there's a big point here that if Sony want to officially do it, you know, not opening like a dev mode where you can do it yourself, then the licensing alone, I mean, if you combine all the PS1 and all the PS2 games, I mean, I think I read something like there's something like 8,000 of them in total. So that is a hell of a lot of games and companies to reach out to and and license for. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about this on the show before. I think there's a story about when the, um, the Xbox One, they revealed how many people are actually using original Xbox and PS um, and Xbox 360 emulation. And it was something like, I can't remember the exact number, but it was like 5% of people had ever installed one. Yeah, it was a really small well, amount, Well, this it? one's very different as well, because like the older PlayStations, you could play the previous generation's titles, whereas this one, you put the disc in, but then it actually downloads the copy yeah. of it. It's not playing it from the disc. It's not. It's not kind of backwards compatible like the old ones were which makes it a lot more again they've got to license it and they've got to go the effort of porting it essentially to do that and again i mean i don't know about you guys i i can't remember the last time i even on the ps3 i might have put a ps1 disc in once to see how it worked oh you you see i'm I'm retro through and through i've the amount of xbox and xbox 360 games i've played on my xbox one is crazy Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, if I want to do that, though, I'll just use my PS1. I, I can imagine I all the Metal yeah. Gear Solid fans and stuff. You know, they probably play all of that to death. You know, all the old versions as well. Yeah, true. But I mean, the five percent doesn't surprise me. To be perfectly honest, like if it's that low of pe- amount of people who have, but because not everybody's like that kind of retro. And like, and, and if you are, I guess you could argue, Dan, you're more retro than me because you'd rather just play it on the original hardware. So. Hmm. So yeah, I guess it's it's, it's interesting. So because I was thinking to myself when Ravi was saying like, oh, PlayStation could just patch it, but I was thinking to myself, PlayStation probably aren't bothered until there's millions of people who want it, and you know the chance of it being millions of people is probably quite small, I guess. And, and maybe play, uh, so maybe Xbox just thought like, oh, well, this is going to happen anyway because mm. of our architecture and how it's done. We might as well charge nineteen dollars to give them access for it and <laughs> make a little bit of cash on the side. And it gets them some lovely headlines as well. I mean, they must be buzzing over these uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> these headlines yeah. that have come out over the last couple of weeks. So if you want to read more about that and everything else we talked about, you'll find them all at theretrohour.com. Uh, just before we get into our best moments of 2020, let's give a huge shout to our amazing friends at the wonderful Retro Gamer magazine that, of course, is brought to you by the wonderful Future Publishing. Now, this is actually your last week if you want to claim this incredible offer that we've got on right now. Now, this is where you can get 95% off the price of your favourite Future Publishing gaming magazine and get three issues for just one pound. People must hear that and be like, what, seriously, a pound? Free for a pound, free for a pound. (laughs) (laughs) In Ravi's best market store voice. <laughs> this is true, actually. And this is exclusively for listeners of the Retro Hour podcast. Now, you can get PlayStation, the official PlayStation magazine, Retro Gamer, Edge, or PC Gamer. And there is so much going on in all of those magazines this month. I mean, talking about Retro Gamer magazine, they've got a cover feature about one of the best platform shoot 'em up games ever, The History of Turrican. Are you a big Turrican fan, Ravi? Uh, yeah, I like I like the Turrican games, and uh, I, I remember there was one called Hurricane. I hope they actually cover that, which was like a kind of modern remake. But also, they're celebrating twenty five years of Worms, and Worms is just an amazing title. I love as well one thing that they do in Retro Gamer every month. They kind of go back to a different year and talk about what was happening in gaming that year. They also talk about movies and music as well. I mean, this month have gone back to 2004, and uh, top of the music chart this week in 2004, another one of Joe's favourites, Michelle McManus from uh, Pop Idol doing All This Time. I don't even know what that is, Dan. (laughs) (laughs) I bet bet Dan knows it off by heart. I well and truly thought you were going to come out with the Bob the Builder like Christmas number one or something then I was just like yeah, this is this is way worse <laughs> <laughs> but on a serious note they also cover Silent Hill and Skies of Arcadia which two of my favorite franchises there um really really awesome games to be and you know Skies of Arcadia does not get enough love so for them to cover that as well is awesome and number one in the GameCube chart Mario Kart Double Dash oh, yeah. that was number one in the that game. doesn't yeah, surprise me that doesn't surprise me at all Project Gotham Racing 2, 
as well in the Xbox chart. That was a brilliant racing game. So a real nostalgia fix in Retro Gamer magazine. But actually, if you want to check these magazines out for yourself, you need to do this right now. So sign up by using our exclusive code and get three issues for just one pound. And like I mentioned, this is the last week you can do this. So do it quick. Head to magazinesdirect.com forward slash retro hour 341 and save up to 95% on official PlayStation magazine, Retro Gamer, Edge or PC Gamer by going to magazinesdirect.com forward slash retro hour 341 with our amazing friends at Future Publishing. Now, of course, we do have a patron running at the moment as well. You can uh, check out another episode of our exclusive behind-the-scenes patrons-only podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours. This week, we're going to be talking about our uh, our top five consoles. Have you had to think about this yet, guys? I was actually thinking about that earlier, and I was thinking we need to mm-hmm. record it. And then I was like, oh, my God, we're doing our top five consoles. I was like, oh, my God. Like, now, the more I think about it, that's not actually that easy. Like When you mentioned it the other week, I was like, <laughs> yeah, easy, easy peasy. But now I'm really struggling and I don't want to do a cop out and be like, oh, number one's the Mega Drive and the SNES kind of thing. (laughs) So I'm going to have to go for CD32, aren't I? Because the Amiga's a a, a computer. Don't give it away. Yeah, I know we're giving too much away here. (laughs) Now we are going to have a proper think about that and do an episode all about our uh, top five consoles. And interestingly, I've ripped this idea off uh, Console Shock when I was on there recently. We're going to try and guess what each of those favourite consoles are mm. at the top five as well like as we go like along. That. So that should be a bit of fun. You, yeah. So we're going to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go, that's my number one giving away, Randy. I did like the Uyo when it came His out. Mondo. Was, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, even if people heard me on the Console Shop podcast, I can't remember what I said on there. And chances are it's probably going to change, you know, by the day between now and when we record that. Um, so that will be coming out very soon. We've got another patrons hangout that we're going to do uh, probably between Christmas and New Year. Um, looking at probably Sunday 27th for all around then. That should be a, a good one as well when we're all feeling festive. So if you join us on Patreon, not only will you be supporting the Retro Hour podcast and making sure that we can continue to bring out this show for you every single Friday throughout 2021, but also you get the exclusive podcast, join us for the hangouts, get an early ad-free episode as well, and you will get a mention on a future episode in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, thank you so much to Anthony Hayden, Stephen Marshall, Pilluck, and Graeme Sinclair, who all backed us on Patreon. If you'd like to do the same, you'll find the link at theretrohour.com. Right then, 2020 has been a unusual year, to say the least, but for this podcast, we've had some incredible highlights, and we'll be going through our best of 2020 next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast at the end of 2020, our final normal episode of the year before the Retro Hour annual Christmas Super Quiz comes up next year. And then we take, a, I believe, a well-deserved rest on Christmas Day. No one wants to listen to the Retro Hour on Christmas Day, let's be honest. There's guys. probably one person out there going, where's the Retro Hour today? <laughs> <laughs> We normally do take that week between Christmas and New Year off, but um, yeah, the do fall actually on Christmas Day. Our next episode is going to be on New Year's Day, and we're already recording stuff for that. I mean, we've got a really good show lined up to kick off the new year. But let's have a little bit of a retrospective of 2020. I tell you what, it's a year we're never going to forget, isn't it? Uh, I think for the whole of our life, we're going to be referring to 2020 from now on. I definitely will be. I had a daughter. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, even even in our personal lives, I mean, mm. what what I love about doing this show is since we started it five years ago, I mean, got so much has happened. We've all moved houses since then. You know, Joe, you, you and I both got married. You've had a kid since then. I've got a dog. Yeah. You know, yeah. like all these responsibilities that are coming along. <laughs> <laughs> Rav's got a cat. He's got, he's got a shed as he's well. Got he's got a shed. Proper man. He's got his carrots. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we're all, I mean, you know, life constantly changes. And doing this show week in, week out, I mean, I'll be honest, I've really missed not seeing you guys every week this year. I was thinking about this earlier on in the episode. I have literally seen, I saw Ravi for two minutes in like, I can't even remember when it was. It was like September. Months ago, wasn't it? It was, it wasn't even September. It might have been like August. Pre-summer, I think. July or something. I literally, because of, we got a package delivered and it got delivered to Ravi's by accident. Uh, So I went and picked it up. And then I think I saw you, Dan, when there was a bit of a break in the lockdown, you came and set up my computer for me and stuff for about an hour. And it was like surreal. <laughs> like, yeah. I can't wait to see you boys again. I miss you too much. And I tell you what, you know, 
like all you guys listening and stuff, I'm really glad that you've been enjoying the show and it's been a bit of escapism. But I also think it's kept me, Joe and Dan sane and mm. it's kept us in a routine as well, which is really essential when you don't know what day's what and what uh, what up or down is, you know? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And the fact that, you know, our patrons enabled us to keep doing the show because when we, we I remember before lockdown happened the first one back in March here in the UK we knew it was coming mm. so we we had like a mammoth recording session didn't we where it was we like did four hours wasn't th- it or something crazy well I think we, well we did three shows back to back and we had interviews already done so I think it was about six hours I that think. was the last time I'd uh, ventured into town and I went in there dressed yeah. like a kind of commando covered in like um, all of these masks and all of this stuff and gloves and everything a covid commander yeah COVID that was commando. It. We just got in the studio and did a marathon session but we didn't know what was going to happen and that kind of gave us time to then set up the remote studios but without your guys support you know we probably wouldn't be doing this podcast now no. I mean, you know, originally we thought, oh, it's only going to be a couple of weeks. So, you know, you, you guys had like cheap USB microphones. And then when we realised this is going to be a bit more of a long-term kind of thing. Because, I mean, at the start of the year, you remember that when we started to Patreon, it was originally to get a studio space. And we, Ravi and I were going around Nottingham City Centre with a couple of our friends we we're going to share a studio with looking at putting down deposits and building. We actually had meetings, didn't we? And we went yeah. into buildings and we met with different people and uh, we were going to do a partnership and everything. And, I was yeah. going to say, it does not feel like that long ago. I remember the three of us, I think it was last December, we all met up in um, Costa Coffee, I think it was, and we were talking about it, like this is what we're, we're going to do. We're going to launch the Patreon and stuff like that. And, you know, even if that's not successful, this is what we're going to try and do with it. And, it, it was it's just it feels so surreal now that like that we didn't do that but not only did we not do that this has been so much more successful than we ever thought it would be well i'm glad we didn't yeah. do it because if we got a building we would have been locked out of it for all yeah. this time yeah exactly God. that would have been terrible paying rent for like nine months and not being able to get oh, in there yeah. thankfully that crisis was avoided but i mean thanks to you guys we managed to get you know our lovely roadcasters that we've got at home these nice microphones and we're unable because yeah, we, we didn't know that if we could do this show remotely you know we'd never done a podcast where we didn't look into each other's eyes and you know I kind mean, of have these visual th- there cues was and one where we went to my mate's studio and we had to record away from your studio and it I think there was a band rehearsing next door and it (laughs) was me and Dan sat on this table with like insulation everywhere. It was a bit mental. And that was our only other kind of remote one that we'd done. But thankfully, I mean, we just want to say a big thank you so much to our amazing patrons who've enabled us to keep the consistent quality going and just enabled us to get the show every week. So, um, you know, we're in a really good place at the moment. 2020 has actually been apart from everything that's gone on, the best year that we've ever had for this podcast. Not only in terms of, I think, quality guests that we've had on, but also in terms of listening numbers. There are more people listening to the show every week than there ever have been. So again, a massive thank you. And I think it's time that we have a little look back on some of our personal highlights. Now, if you don't mind, guys, I'd like to start with um, one of my favourite guests of the year. And this is RJ Michael. Oh, legend. Now, RJ, obviously, one of the fathers of the Amiga but not only the Amiga, also behind other systems I love, like the, um, the Atari Lynx and the 3DO. And RJ is a guy that we've met several times at shows. And he is, RJ, I'd say, is he's energy personified, isn't he, Ravi? He, he's an enigma. Um, RJ Michael, he's amazing. I, I just remember being outside Amsterdam and someone was like, you know, RJ's quite an old dude. And they were like... Do you, do you want some water or something? You know, you've been going all day. Water, get me a beer. <laughs> He's the dude, RJ, yeah. I, re- I remember RJ was still up partying at about five in the morning when me and you turned it in. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so. He's a fantastic character. And also he, he kind of personifies that like old school Silicon Valley style. He is amazing. And a lot of people assumed that we'd already had him on the show. But the reason we didn't is just because we couldn't sit RJ down for five (laughs) minutes to interview him long enough. 
at shows. Because, you know, there's always someone wanting his attention or something else happens. But luckily, after five years of nagging him, when COVID came along and he was working from home, he finally agreed to sit down and share some of his stories. And I'm so glad that he did. Now, of course, I'll link up the full episode if you want to check it out. But one of my favourite anecdotes from the RJ Michael interview that we did back in the summer was when RJ shared the story about how he stopped smoking. And I'm sitting around a campfire and I'm smoking a cigarette. I've been smoking cigarettes for a number of years at this point in my life. I'm thinking that I'm about to move to California and California is a very healthy place. You know, I, I, I recognized when I was interviewing there that no one smoked cigarettes that, that I saw or that I knew of. There was no smoking in the place. And I'm sitting around this campfire thinking, I'm going to go to California. It's, it is such a healthy place, and I'm going to be the only cigarette smoker, and I've got this vision of myself out there standing behind, you know, next to the dumpster out back, slowly, <laughs> lonely, smoking a cigarette. And, and I had, you know, wanted to quit so many times in my life before, and I, 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 sitting around that campfire thought, this is it. I should do it. I should quit. And, and you know, and... and go to California and not be a smoker anymore and and really do it. And I said to myself, you know, I'm going to do it. As soon as I'm done with this pack, I'm going to quit and I'm going to be done with it. And then I remembered how many times in the past I had said that to myself. As soon as I'm done with this pack, I'm going to be done with it. I must have quit smoking a dozen times before this. And so I said, nope. I'm done now. And I flicked my cigarette into the fire and I took the pack out of my pocket and gave it a light crush and threw it into the fire. And that was it. And then you quit? Never again? Almost. I smoked one more time. It was during, during Amiga Computer. And uh, I had just, I had a big success. I was working on uh, intuition. I just uh, accepted the task of getting intuition done. And uh, I had gotten a rectangle that was the prototype window, the first window. I had gotten the rectangle up correctly. And it was a great moment in life I needed to celebrate. I ran out of my office and and there was no one else there. There's only a security guard in the front and I'm running through the building trying to find someone who I I could celebrate this and everyone was gone and there was nothing to do. There was the the vending machine had candy bars and I thought maybe I could celebrate with a candy bar. There was a nearby tavern. I could go get a beer, but I knew if I got a beer, I wouldn't really want to work anymore. And I had other stuff I still wanted to do and I didn't know what to do. And I'm walking through the lobby of the building. And the security guard is smoking a cigarette. It's a menthol, menthol cigarette. And so I said, I'll do that. It's been six months or whatever it is, five months, six months. I'm going to celebrate. I'm, I'm going to let myself have one cigarette because I missed it so much. And, and this is a cause for celebration. I'm going to do it. So I asked the guy if I could mooch a smoke off of him. And he said, yes. And I took it back to my office and I lit it up and I smoked maybe two or three puffs of it. And suddenly, abruptly turned violently ill, down on my knees with my garbage can. And after a wretched 15 minutes, I finally calmed down enough that I could drag my coat off of the chair down to the ground with me. And I fell asleep for about two hours on the floor of my office with my coat as a pillow until I, I woke up and just feeling foul and vile and grungy, just dirty and wrong and putrid, dragged myself to my car and went home and slept it off. And that was my last cigarette. And it's pissed me off all of these years too, because the, you know if, if my first cigarette had had that effect on me, I wouldn't have smoked for all of those yeah. years. But <laughs> it, was a, it was a definite period at the end of that sentence. <laughs> What an absolute legend. So if you're doing a check out the full interview with RJ Michael, if you haven't heard it yet, you need to check it out. One of my favourite guests of the year. Uh, For you, Joe, um, this was a really good interview that you and I did all about 
one of the most infamous video games companies of all time, Micropro. Yeah, we interviewed Wild Bill, Wild Bill Steely earlier this year. And uh, it was his storytelling. It just compelled me like the whole way through the interview. Like, I don't know a lot about Micropros. And to be perfectly honest, I probably didn't learn what I should have learned from Micropros. <laughs> what I took away from inter- this interview was some of the uh, the celebrities, if you will. And, you know, just some of the storytelling, some of the stories he had to tell were just his life in general, you know, um, meeting Richard Branson and uh, Trip Hawkins and stuff like that. And just kind of the discussions that went on behind the scenes. But um, this particular clip um, is just one of the stories he was telling, which I absolutely loved. I think you asked the question, Dan, um, about his relationship with uh, Tom Clancy, um, which I just thought was absolutely fantastic when they were doing some games for him. I decided that uh, Tom Clancy, because I knew about his first book, uh, would be a good speaker because uh, uh, I had met him by him calling the Pentagon where I was working at the time asking questions and someone put him over to me because I was in the game business and he was in the book business. Okay. So anyway, I got to talk to him and I invited him to come to a YPO meeting and I have 50 company presidents uh, at this dinner and he's going to be our, our speaker. And he stands up and he says, you know, I normally don't like to be in a room with 50 uh, guys richer than me. I went, wow, this is going to go really good, isn't it? Woo. <laughs> so <laughs> we got to know each other pretty good, and we were not close friends. All he did invite Sid and I down to go shooting with him at his house. He had a shooting range in his basement, for God's sakes. I don't know why he couldn't see from me to the computer screen. His glasses were thicker than mine. So anyway, we went down, visited him once or twice. We had, And, you know, he could talk your ear off. Uh, unfortunately, I can too. And Sid can listen but ask really good questions. So we got to know him a little bit. And that's when I said, well, why don't we license Red Storm Rising from you? Now, I don't know if you ever read Red Storm Rising, but there's lots of different parts of it. He told me there was a, a wimpy Zumi. A Zumi is an Air Force Academy graduate. He said he put the wimpy Zumi in there because that would be me. He was just picking on me. I, I said, oh, I'm not wimpy, Tom. He says, well, you are sometimes. <laughs> I said, thank you, Tom. So anyway, uh, Sid took it and made a a very nice uh, submarine game out of it. And, uh, you know, we sold very well uh, Red Storm Rising. It wasn't an F-15, but it sold very well. And then we asked Tom to come to a trade show. And, uh, you know, he was this big technology guy. He was afraid of airplanes. He rode a train from Baltimore (laughs) to Las Vegas. (laughs) No way. (laughs) And we had all these interviews lined up for him, but he kept disappearing. And we couldn't find him. And I finally asked my secretary, where is Tom? She says, every time you don't need him, he's down in the adult uh, movie section down below in the basement. (laughs) We had to go get him. He says, so these people really like me. I said, Tom, they want to know if you can make them a book that they can make into one of those adult movies. But we had to (laughs) drag him up to an interview. What a legend. Wild Bill Steely. He was one of my favourite guests as well, Joey. He was just like, his storytelling was second. Oh, God, it was amazing. I was I was gripped. Like, I want to say on the edge of my seat because it was exciting. Like, it wasn't like, oh, my God, it's a thrill ride. But he just, there was something about him that just, it was just, I just never switched off the whole way through that interview. It was amazing. Now, some of my favourite episodes that we do are the ones that are about the more unusual sides of technology and gaming, things that you might not have heard before. And I know you enjoyed doing this one, Ravi, where the Ed Smith, the untold story of the imagination machine. Yeah, I, I totally love doing this story with Ed because Ed had a different path to everybody else. You know, he was raised in Brownsville, New York, which was essentially a ghetto back then. And he kind of worked with an electronics guy and they uh, followed him around. Uh, There was lots of electrocution as well. And he eventually got into electronics and then he joined APF and uh, created the Imagination Machine. And the best thing I loved about this interview was you guys hadn't heard of the Imagination Machine. And afterwards, you were like, I want this machine now. My first exposure to electronics in general Um, was probably at a very young age. In fact, I think it was around 10 or 11 years old. And I actually worked with uh, an electrician who would um, repair lights, switches, et cetera, in the homes that we were renting uh, in Brooklyn. And I would be his helper. So I would hand him his pliers, his cutters, et cetera. Uh, So that was my first exposure. And I saw him getting shocked and all of those types of things. But it was really interesting to see the work that he was doing. And I did take a liking to it. And I think that was the 
the launch pad for me at that point. So he kind of made the mistakes and you <laughs> yeah. observed. And then, uh, yes, yes. I it. saw him make the mistakes and I tried not, not to make the same mistakes, but of course I did anyway. Well, you were raised in a very tough times as well in uh, Brownsville, New York. What, what was the situation like at the time? So Brownsville in Brooklyn, just to give you some, some background, um, as far as uh, inner city neighborhoods were concerned, it was right up there with uh, the south side of Chicago and, and Oakland in California, Long Beach in California. Um, it was a, an environment that was um, primarily set up to house multiple people stacked upon each other uh, for no good reason with very little resources put into those neighborhoods to help the residents as much as they needed the help that they could get, but it just was not available. So growing up in Brownsville was growing up in a ghetto environment uh, where you had uh, a series of activities going on that were not very meaningful as a youth, like drugs, like crime, uh, like prostitution, all of that activity as far as, as well as muggings and murders were prevalent in a an environment uh, like Brownsville. And that was the world that I had to grow up in. And I, I guess there wasn't that much investment there either and kind of resources uh, to, to, to keep the kids entertained. So did you have to kind of come up with your own entertainment? Yes, as, as much as we could, you know, at, at, at a young age as a child growing up in an environment like Brownsville, your entertainment is very limited. Um, we did try some things as kids. We put together our own bicycles because we couldn't afford to pay for them. So we would scrounge for parts to put together a bicycle and, and try to ride a bike. Uh, we would um, make our own slingshots and break a few windows. We were, If we were lucky enough, we had a, uh, a baseball so that we could play baseball in the park once we were able to get to the park but most times it was just a a rubber ball that we would use to play stickball with you know i've been checking ebay ever since ravi they don't come up very often these imagination machines no no and uh <laughs> you know it's just fascinating to kind of hear a, hear a different path um to computing from ad now, another guest that we got on in 2020 was someone else whose door we'd been knocking on since day one. I think it's fair to say Dominic Diamond is possibly our most requested guest ever. I literally, from, as you were saying that, start, I, yeah. I, I was looking down and I looked up when you said one of our most requested, I was like, Dominic Diamond, like as soon as you said it. <laughs> so Dominic Diamond, I looked up at the show notes, I was like, yeah, Dominic Diamond. Like the amount of times I'm on Facebook and I look at our page, you know, on the messages and it's like, when are you going to get Dom on and kind of thing. So yeah, this this was pretty unreal when you got this one in the bag. How many times did you have to ask him, Ravi? <laughs> um, I, I'd asked him about four or five times, actually. And then um, I think our mutual love of gardening um, seemed to seal the <laughs> deal on Instagram. And uh, it's just fantastic talking to Dom. I really, really love this interview. Now, for those outside the UK, I mean, if you haven't heard that episode, Games Master, the Dominic was a host of back in the early 90s, it was an institution here in Britain, a show that everyone that loved video games sat down and watched of an evening. But also they had Patrick Moore, who was actually an astronomer. You know, I remember reading his space books when I was a kid, but he played the role of the Games Master, which was really out of character and very unusual. But even though they were together on the show for many years, it turned out that Dom actually only met Patrick on one occasion. And I loved it when he told us all about that classic meeting. Uh, Patrick Moore was the only person uh, more clueless about the programme than Channel 4's commission <laughs> department. Um, uh, Patrick was, was apparently just an absolute professional's professional. He would turn up to the little green screen studio. He would get handed uh, this uh, script. He would understand very little of it but he would knock it out in one take. <laughs> he was just, I just got it. He just got the nuances and everything like that. And, uh, and yeah, I, I don't know who had this idea. I know that there was other people considered at the time, or at least we, we had this list of, of people we would get in to be Games Master if Patrick died, because that was always a kind of possibility. <laughs> Although, ironically, given 
what I got up to in the nineties was probably more chance of me dying <laughs> than Patrick at that point. But yeah, so we had uh, other people, mostly Doctor Who's. It was basically, you know, like uh, Tom Pertwee, uh, um, sorry, uh, John Pertwee, Tom Baker. They were the other ones, but uh, no, Patrick was was absolutely fantastic. And the, the only kind of sad thing is, is that I only met him once uh, in all that time. And I actually, maybe it's not sad. Maybe this is perfect. I met him on the very, very last day that either of us filmed anything on Games Master. This was after all the stuff had been done, the main set and the set had been stripped. This was the little extra stuff that we do in little studios. So we'd record Patrick in a little separate green screen studio. And I would go along to that same studio to record voiceovers for things like, you know, the review sections and the features. And I remember turning up and Patrick Moore was literally leaving as I was entering if I'd been five minutes later, I would never have met him. And he didn't even recognize me. He kind of looked at me. <laughs> hello, hello, yeah. hello, young man. And I'm like, uh, Patrick, Dominic. He- he- hello. And he starts looking a bit nervous. Who's this giant hairy Scotsman? It's been Dominic Diamond from Games Master. And then he's like, oh, well, I never. Hello. And, um, and we talked about cricket for like about 30 <laughs> minutes. And, and it was a wonderful conversation that we had. And then that's it. Patrick went up the street and I uh, went into the studio and that was the one and only time that I met him. But I like—I think that was a really nice little kind of coda to the show as a whole. What a legend. I can't believe that we had Dom on this year as well. That was like childhood dream fulfilled. But he wasn't the only celebrity that we had on the Retro Hour podcast in 2020. Dara O'Brien came on for a chat as well. Yeah, this this is my second pick. This was an amazing interview that me and Ravi did. Uh, I think it might be like maybe the first or second time me and Ravi ever did an interview together. Um, but I absolutely loved this. This might have been the hardest edit Dan probably ever had to do with me because I was laughing so much the whole <laughs> way through this interview. Like this guy is just a comedian 24-7. Um, but what I absolutely loved was, you know, we talked about all the gaming memories and stuff like that, but we also talked about the uh, video game awards um, and just his experience there. And he just told an absolutely fantastic story um, about one of my favorite game developers, Hideo Kojima, which I absolutely love. I did a, um, uh, a one of the BAFTAs, uh, your man was there, um, Hideo? Yeah, no. Hideo. Um, oh, um, the, oh, Hideo Kojima. Hideo Kojima was there. Yeah. And- uh, it was there were two wonderful things about that. First was that uh, actually the second was that he delivered a speech with, in Japanese and mm-hmm. it was translated, but the translator wasn't beside him. The translator was just working off a microphone at the sound desk, so he would say he was doing, and then he'd stand, and then a voice would say uh, what he had said in English, mm. which is slightly weird. Mm. Um, and I said thank you to Hujia for delivering a speech both in Japanese and telepathically. <laughs> um, uh, and the, but before that, uh, he had been in the front row, and I said, Hideo Kojima is here, uh, and everyone applauded. And I said, Hey, I want to ask you one question. And from behind the podium, I took a box and then I climbed into the box, and I was on the box going, Am I hiding now, Hideo? Am I hiding? <laughs> Am I hiding? <laughs> <laughs> It was partly a reference to the day to days. Is this cool? Is this cool? <laughs> me on the floor going, can you not see me now, Hideo? Can you? Can you not see me? Can you not see me? <laughs> I bet um, he was just sat there, just stunned. <laughs> because he doesn't speak English, it turned yeah. out. <laughs> so so I'm, I, I'm sure he got it because I'm, I'm pointing at him, smiling, and then I climb into a box, I say <laughs> something, and then I get out of the box and go do, do a big, huh? <laughs> at him. Like, so he, he got it. But it was like, still, okay, have I flown for 12 hours to have a <laughs> large man just go, am I, is it, is it a day with a box over my head? Have oh. I disappeared now? <laughs> I'm going to have to look that up because I've not seen that. That's brilliant. It's quite sweet as a thing. Like, I think I may, like it may, I, interesting if you watch it and I, 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 you know, if I bail after two goes, if I go, am I hiding now? And then I get out of the box really quickly means it didn't get the laugh I thought it would. <laughs> I did hear it, hey, people got it, but just in case, you may see that I went, let's get out of the cardboard box real quick. 
Yeah, so like you said, I wasn't involved in that interview, but listening to it, I mean, I, you know, I had a bit of a rough year this year with my dad passing away back in the summer, but actually hearing that as a listener, that actually put me in a good mood and just made me forget about everything for an hour or so. So, I mean, great work on that interview, guys. And Dara, I mean, you could just tell, especially, I think you, Joe, really had a connection with him in terms of the games that you like. Yeah, no, that um, that actually touched me that you said that. That's really nice. Thank you. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, Ravi said that as well after the interview, you know, um, we just seemed to hit it off, which was really cool. And, you know, he was just such a down to earth sound guy. You know, you got to think this guy's, you know, probably like, he's not like a gozillionaire, but he's probably a millionaire at least. And he was just so real with us. And you know what I also loved as well, just kind of last point on this, is he'd actually been asked by the BBC to do a podcast with them the day after we asked him and he turned them down because he said he didn't want to do that to us. He was like, I don't want to dupe you like that. He was like, you know, I'm coming on. I've already agreed to you guys. So come on, I'll do yours and then I'll do theirs next year or something, which I thought that's amazing. Thank you for that. What a dude. He knows where the cool guys yeah. is. He wants to hang out exactly. with Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, another one of our, uh, I love this episode as well, Ravi. Another one of your picks this year was um, John Gibson. Now, we did an episode with him um, just before lockdown, actually, at the start of March, talking about Imagine Software and the ill-fated Mega Games. Yeah, so I'd actually attempted to do an interview with John the year before because John's based in Thailand. And uh, I tried to do it, but I think there was like a Thai festival going on in the background. So there's like loads of music and horns and vehicles and stuff. And I, the, it kind of had to get scrapped. But then we did the interview again this year. And oh, my God, it was absolutely fantastic. Imagine was such a cool company back in the days. But also John was like the cool dude programmer. You know, he he wrote Bandersnatch, but... Um, We've had Charlie Brooker on the show, and, and and John actually said he hasn't played Bandersnatch, the uh, game on Netflix, and uh, it was just really interesting to 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 kind of see behind the company. And you all remember that famous documentary where the bailiffs came into Imagine and the uh, oh, commercial breaks, commercial yeah. breaks. Yeah, well, in this clip, John talks about um, actually hiding in the toilets. Um, <laughs> With the Bandersnatch source code and hard drives and huge computer as well, trying to escape the bailiffs, and then they managed to make a sharp exit and uh, get out of there with the source code. Well, it wasn't quite that. <clears throat> it was actually um, Eugene Evans and I. Uh, we we wanted to uh, get our uh, development kits out of the office so we can take them to Dave Lawson's house in um, on the Wirral. So we could carry on writing banners. So that was the idea. But the bailiffs wouldn't let you take anything out of the office. But Eugene and I managed to grab uh, these big uh, development kits and, and run up, run to one of the back doors. I think that somebody <laughs> spotted us going out, shouting, "Oi, you know, come back!" So we went. We carried on, went through the door, then we put those toilets out. We went in the toilets, put in a, a cubicle, uh, put the they stood on the stood on the um, the toilet seat with the development kit in their hands and, and waited until they'd gone away because they came in there looking at the toilet, couldn't see uh, us in there, so they went out <laughs> and then we ran down the stairs and uh, Eugene put his kit in his Lotus and I put my kit in my Porsche and off he went. <laughs> and and was it quite in. quite a big kit as well? Well, yeah, it was a, it was a Sage 4, it must be, <laughs> I don't know, it's like six inches tall, but a foot wide and about 18 inches long, and it's, uh, it's it's got a metal case. Uh, I mean, it was bloody heavy. It had a, a, an old fashioned hard disc, which was very heavy. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of my favourite episodes as well. I think, you know, just the fact that those games were so legendary and, you know, what a massive flop Imagine Software turned out to be, you know, how, how hard they fell. I think it was really interesting getting those stories from John. Um, another one of my favourite episodes this year, I mean, we kind of hit two birds with one stone this year. We've got two of my favourite gaming shows from when I was a kid on the Retro Hour podcast. Not only did we do Dominic Diamond about Games Master, but also Violet Berlin. How many times an hour of her time? we asked oh. Violet and been back and forth? And uh, yeah. yeah, and it finally happened this year, which was just amazing. 
Well, this was another one of my favourite shows as a kid, the brilliant Bad Influence. I mean, we did an episode with Andy Crane, who was her co-host a couple of years ago, but Violet was really, she was like the gamer on the show, wasn't she? Andy was more the presenter, but Violet was a real video games fan. And in this clip, I love this, because when she joined the show, she didn't even realise that she was going to be one of the show's main presenters. But basically, uh, from playing that NES, I became completely obsessed with video games and I loved them. And um, base- did did live review uh, did live reviews of games with kids every week, twice a week actually, for about a year. And uh, as you can imagine, this made me something of an aficionado. And after the NES, we got in all the other systems, and you know, I got right across it. Uh, and incidentally, they were the first games, you know, regular games coverage on UK TV. And they were really popular. And then after um, Call Cube finished, I went off to do a BBC One show called Wild Bunch, which is a wild animal show. And I did that for a series. And, you know, it was fine, but it wasn't quite me. And after that, suddenly the series ended and suddenly everything was quiet. I had like nothing on whatsoever. And I was living in London. And you know what it's like in London if you've got no work? And, you know, you're in a city, busy city, you've got no work, you've got no money, you can't go out, there's nothing happening. And I used this time to uh, play the, uh, play my, but I did have all these consoles from the Cool Cube days. So I was playing all these, these games and everything. And I just decided that I'd really love to, you know, do a, do more with games or do a game show. And I actually applied for a couple of game shows, but I didn't get and meanwhile bought myself a computer and like became the person that all my friends knew all my friends knew was the person who knew about computers and games that was it and then one of them heard about a show bad influence that was being considered up in yorkshire tv that was for that was going to cover games and computers and they immediately thought of me i got in touch with a guy there called richard maud and I said, look, I, you know, I can, I don't mind what I'd love to work on this show. I don't mind what I do. I'm happy to, you know, research. I'm happy to find the games. I'm happy to present the show. Um, you know, I can do any of this. And I didn't really expect much to come of it. And in fact, me and my boyfriend of the time, who moved to Manchester by this point, we had, we were sort of running out of money and we decided to go on a, go on a, a, sort of three month tour around Eastern Europe to spend the last of the money that we had, you know, our savings Mm. and then come back and like get sensible jobs. That's what we decided to do. And um, Richard Maud uh, sort of messaged me and said, oh, come in and see me at Yorkshire TV. And I said, oh, I'm about to go away, but I'll come and see you. So on the day that I was due to go around Eastern Europe in this old car, we loaded up the car, we drove to Yorkshire TV. Um, My boyfriend waited for me in in, in the Ford. I went to, to the bar with Richard Maud and had a chat about my interest in games and computers and all the rest of it, and that I'd do anything on the show if they wanted it. And then I went, got back in the car. We went off. We had the whole um, adventure around Eastern Europe. We came back, like, ready to open the papers and look for typing jobs or whatever it was that we could get, because I decided that I wasn't really going to get another TV job again. And um, uh, I got a call from Yorkshire TV saying, oh, will you come in? You know, we want you to come and work on the show. Will you come in? So I was like, oh, yeah, but they hadn't told me what my job was. So I just assumed that my job would be to, you know, just, uh, you know, find the games or whatever. I mean, I wasn't unhappy with that. I was delighted with that. I mean, I thought I was going to get free games. You know, games would cost a fortune. I'd been playing the same, you know, few games I managed to save from the days of Core Cube over and over and over again. You know, we'd like lent the console to my sister so so that she'd be lured into buying Mega Man 2 so that we could go and play (laughs) it over at her house. You know, this was, these were the dire straits we were in. And, uh, you know, games were like 40 or 50 quid. They were like, you know, an investment, weren't they? So, um, I was like jumping around for joy at the free games and the works. So I wouldn't have to go and do typing or whatever. I went over there I went, and they said, oh, it's like this, this lunch, this production lunch. And there was me and Andy Crane and, you know, all the people on the, like, aha. And literally over lunch, somebody mentioned, I think it might have been the guy who ran the show, like, so, and I knew present, you know, and our presenters, Violet and Andy. And that was when I knew that I was presenting it. No way. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, Joe, I know you love it when we get YouTubers on, and, and we all love it when we get to chat to people behind YouTube channels that we're big fans of. And this year, you spoke to Corey and Try from the channel My Life in Game. Yeah, this was awesome. I love talking to the YouTubers, and you know, Ravi reached out to them, and they were they were more than happy to come on the show. And uh, we just built really good rapport with them. You know, we were talking about all different you know FPSs and stuff like that, um, and different you know just different cables and stuff. It was just really cool just to to bounce off each other, just like kind of like their childhood and our childhood as well. And this clip is literally just literally just a little conversation we were having um about different frames per seconds on different in different territories. Because there is enough of a market for these RGB cables and people I know get frustrated with the the availability situation. But you know, when these are being handmade, like that's that's just the reality of it. you can buy like if you go to like AliExpress or eBay or whatever, there are, you know, a lot of really cheap SCART cables and they aren't mm. properly shielded. Uh, and there will be noise introduced from the uh, sync line, which is actually mm. just using composite video. Uh, using composite video for your sync line is fine, but those cables are so poorly shielded that it causes interference issues. But if if you you know don't want to wait around for like the specialty cables with like this super high grade uh, cabling, another one that we recommend is Insurrection Industries. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some more mass produced cables, and they're like thirty dollars. I forget if they're still available on Amazon or if you buy them through like. I know that Castlemania Games has stocked them. I think you might be able to buy them directly from the Insurrection Industries website. But those are also very good cables um that and of course there's in in europe you have retro gaming cables uh correct. UK, which is you know the first place that i actually bought any any skirt cables from they've been doing those cables for seven plus years at this point and uh they and they have recently come out with the um the rad 2x which is you know it's console specific upscalers they actually uses the technology from the the retro tank and they were designed by mike chi uh but I mean, retro gaming cables is a, is a good choice for anybody who's based in, you know, in Europe. I was going to say that sure. that made me sound uh, feel really spoiled because when I was younger, I used to go to uh, our pound shop. So, <laughs> you know, and I just used to pick up these really cheap SCAR cables. <laughs> and like you say, they did have a lot of interference, but they were just for gaming on and stuff like that. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, no matter what, it's going to be better than what we had. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> on the CRT of those days, like the, the fidelity was not that high. So you probably wouldn't really notice the flaws anyway. But it's funny because... You know, we get a lot of comments that are like, you know, oh, I'm so so glad I grew up in Europe because we had RGB. And it's like, but you know what? No one really had a perfect system because, yes, we had crap video quality, but we also had 60 hertz. I knew um, you were going to say that. I knew that was coming <laughs> as soon as you said that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's funny. You know, it, I, I guess everyone has a different perspective on which, which was the nicer perk to have. I mean, you you know, I, I, I guess I am glad that we had the 60 hertz because most of the games were designed, at least the games that, that I was playing, uh, you know, were designed in Japan, which also operates at 60 hertz. So usually when the games were brought over to Europe, they kind of did a, a, I don't like to use the word lazy, but, you know, a, a easy conversion. Uh, where it just slowed the game down. But there were, as far as I understand, a lot of games that were speed corrected so that they <laughs> they run at the correct speed, but it's just at, at uh, you know, 50 frames per second we, instead of 60. Growing up, uh, me and my friends, we used to play Mario Kart Double Dash, and you could do that on Double Dash and plug it in right. 60 hertz. And we used to call it fast mode because we didn't know <laughs> why. <laughs> like, let's play on fast mode kind of thing. <laughs> it, it, it's really unfortunate because a lot of times it would it would ruin the the integrity of the music. Yeah. You know, yeah. Having it yeah. slowed down. Yeah. You know, I, I remember I've read stories online of people saying like, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their American friend, you know, who had moved to Europe, you know, pe people at school would say like, oh, their, their copy of F zero is faster. And, you know, that just yeah. sounds like, that just <laughs> sounds like, you know, playground drivel, right? Like it just sounds like something that people just, just made up, but it, it's true that their American friend did have a faster F zero. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> 
And while we're talking about YouTubers, Ravi, you got one of your favourite YouTubers on at the start of the year. Yeah, this was the Gabs24. And, uh, you know, she's not the biggest YouTuber, but she's really interesting. And we we bumped into each other at the um, Games Fair in Nottingham originally. And it, it was great to have somebody from Derby on the podcast because it's kind of local Midlands vibes. And then we met each other at uh, an event in Derby as well, at uh, Derby Quad. And that was really interesting because uh, Heather Gibson was there. And uh, the Geb, she's Gemma, she's a really big fan of Tomb Raider. And of course, Tomb Raider comes from Derby. Um, also being with Core, which was the company that was based there. But in this clip, she talks about talking to the original designer of the NES and the kind of ideas behind that and uh, the questions that she asked. So I find it really interesting because we don't get that many Japanese developers on. So it's always nice to have somebody that's actually taught. Absolutely. And and that's that's what I mean. He was just so kind of down to earth and, and just very real about this product, this you know, massively influential product that he'd created. And I really loved that. I really, really found that quite captivating. So to be honest, it, it, you know, with, with the actual interview itself, I I found that when I look back on it now, I kind of took more around what he'd said about the design and how, how they really tried to push it into the American market. Um, for example, you know how the NES is top loading? That, that was a specific feature that they wanted because at the time in America, obviously VHS was a big thing, movies, VHS, and most affluent households had a VHS. So, and they tended to be top loading in the 80s. So they thought if we make the NES look like a VHS, that's going to immediately appeal to the US market and uh, give us a bit of legway really. So it was the whole kind of design and even down to the zapper, which... Um, I remember him saying in the presentation that they made the zapper purely for the American market on the assumptions that Americans like guns. <laughs> and I was blown away. It's like, wow, you, this, this is actually quite in-depth and uh, I guess well thought out. I don't know. Um, I mean, it sold well, so something certainly went right. But they, they'd gone down to the nth degree in designing that thing, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of talk of prototypes as well, and like the design got mm -hmm. changed so many times um, until they, they were satisfied with the final product. Do you often wonder what the internet would be like, you know, if, uh, if they released like pictures of all those prototypes, though? Because they must be hiding in a warehouse or something somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that's a fascinating question. I mean, it's almost like, yeah, you, you know, somewhere there's a file, there's a there's a computer with, with all these prototypes on. Maybe there's even physical prototypes. And wow, it, it, never mind the internet. I think I would have a meltdown if one came out. <laughs> oh, that would be so, so awesome. Now, we did mention that 2020 has been a year that we've managed to score some guests that we've been trying to get for a long time. And... Jazz Rignall. He was another name that has been heavily requested on Twitter ever since we started doing the show five years ago. And we finally managed to get Jazz to come on for an interview this year. And if you live outside the UK, he might not be a name that you're familiar with, but he was a veteran in the video games magazine industry here in the UK. Zap64, he worked on SCMVG and Mean Machines as well, famously. And I love this clip from him where he's talking about the fact that the early to mid 90s was the most exciting time in video game history that he covered. Oh, that was, it was really exciting. I mean, it still, to me, is the most exciting period of, 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 of sort of writing about video games for me personally. Um, you know, there, there were just so, so many new things going on between sort of 1989 um, and about 1992. You know, sort of, we 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 essentially went from ZX Spectrums and and sort of uh, Commodore sixty fours and Amigas to um, PC Engine and, um, and and Mega Drive. Also, it was the dawn of handheld machines like the Game Boy and the Lynx, and those were very exciting. We even had sort of early VR machines. You know, ex arcade machines were getting very sort of exciting and cutting edge. Uh, during that period, and there were just you know just lesser known, not lesser known, but sort of lesser successful consoles like the Neo Geo to write about. You know, there was just a tremendous amount of 
change in technology with with the advent of, of, of CD-ROMs and things like that, you could just see that, that, that gaming was in the midst of a, a huge transition of technology going from sort of cassette loading to, to CD-ROMs in the space of, you know, just a, sort of three or four years. So it was just tremendously exciting. Every month there seemed like something new and cool was happening. Yeah, it's crazy to think that it all happened in such a short space of time. I guess you're right, we went from playing games like, you know, like you said, Ghostbusters on the Commodore 64 to like games like, you know, Seventh Guest and Mist and stuff like that within less than a decade. It was crazy, really. Yeah, I mean, um, Seventh Guest was, when was that, 1993? 93, I want to say. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, was, it was a space of sort of, you know, sort of almost five or six years and yeah. um, just tremendous acceleration of technology and sort of uh, and video game gaming sort of concepts moving forward at a tremendous rate and 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 really shifting. I I, I kind of look at the sort of that sort of early early to mid nineties as a sort of transitional point between sort of really old school gaming and sort of more like the modern era of gaming where things it definitely felt a lot more modern. And games this year as well. We got follow-ups to video game franchises that we've been fans of all of our lives. And I know, Joe, you were so hyped for Streets of Rage 4. This was like, this wasn't just like a 2020 highlight. This is like a highlight of my life. Like, I love, 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 love Streets of Rage. And when we found out the new one was coming out, absolutely amazing. And then Dan just said, should we try and get them on? I was like, what? And he was like, let's just reach out, try and get them on. And uh, I think you literally just like emailed their contact us bit on their page or something. And they got back to us straight away. And, you know, we had a uh, Cyril and Ben on um, from uh, .mu and Lizard Cube. And it was just a really, really, really cool interview. Um, and my clip is actually going to be about how they got the rights to do the game and how they went to Japan and spoke to the guys at Sega to get it. Um, but yeah, these guys were so down to earth and it was so awesome. And they also gave us some free copies of the game to play a couple of weeks before. So this this was unreal for me. We just had fini- we just had released Wonder Boy: uh, The Dragon Strap uh, with Lizard Cube uh, with Ben. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, like at .mu, we uh, always try to find new cool projects um, and also, uh, you know, like make more and more impact. So having more bigger and bigger uh, licenses uh, to propose to, 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 to the gamers. Um, so the next step uh, was like, okay, so Wonder Boy was partially made in collaboration with Sega because they, they own part of the, of the trademarks. Um, so I was like, we have kind of a history with Wonder Boy with Sega, even if it's very, very light because we didn't have a lot of contact. We had more contact with the original creator. Um, but I was like, okay, that, that would make sense, you know, to look out for a Sega license uh, because there are so many of them and that have lots of potential and haven't, haven't been, you know, back for quite a long time. And of course, as a Sega kid myself, and because I had all, all this experience uh, with Streets of Rage back in the days, I was like, okay, that, that would be super cool to uh, to bring back Streets of Rage. I don't know if it's possible because that's one of the biggest licenses from uh, the, the Genesis, the Mega Drive, but, uh, you know, we should try it out. And so at a party at, uh, at our office, uh, if I remember well, I started to talk about it to, to Ben. And actually Ben uh, already had the idea as well and already had made some sketches of, of a potential sequel to Streets of Rage. For, to Streets of Rage. So that was perfect, you know, like um, we were in, in line with what should be done. And, and I saw Ben's drawings and I was like, oh, that's fucking crazy. Let's do that, you know. Um, and so from there, we started to, you know, you know uh, polish the concept itself. Uh, also think about who should work on this because, um, uh, you know, like uh, Ben was uh, handling all the, 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 the art, the art basically. But uh, we needed like a full team, uh, not only uh, you know arts for the game. So we started to think about who should be involved on the project, uh, uh, what would, would, should the project look like. And once we had uh, a very solid, I mean, like a very solid early concept uh, with arts uh, that Ben did at the day at, back in the days, um, I went to Japan. I managed to get a meeting with uh, the right people at Sega. Um, presented the project and well, well, a couple of weeks later, they said they were interested. And from there, we started to talk a bit, a bit more uh, in depth with them, and and then it was a thing. Well, how much involvement did Sega have in the development of it? Then did you have to kind of run ideas by them? How, how hands on were they? Uh, they were pretty cool. 
we were really used to do that at Dotemu. That's what we do basically. Uh, so that's why we've been doing it for 10 years. Uh, we're really, really used to work with IP owners. We work with very, very picky IP owners uh, on projects like Final Fantasies uh, with Square Enix, for example, or with Konami. Uh, we recently uh, did uh, Castlevania Symphony of the Night on mobile, for example. Um, so we used to really work with uh, Japanese IP owners that are that have a very high level of standard. Um, so we're not really afraid, uh, but it's always, you know, you never know uh, well, what's, what level is going to be, uh, how much involved they, w- they will want to be. And in the end, Sega has been very supportive. Um, they really just sent us feedback every time we were sending them builds and arts and stuff like that. Feedbacks that didn't really made sense and that was in line with what we were thinking as well. Uh, so all in all, it was really smooth, really smooth. And one of the highlights of that interview for me was the fact that they teased, you know, there is going to be more from them, maybe Sega yeah, related in yeah. the future. Yeah, um, fingers crossed for Golden Axe, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> what a year 2021 is going to be. Let's be honest, I mean, we, we can say 2021 can only be better than this year, but I think looking at these clips that we've mentioned so far, I think this has been just the best year for the Retro Hour podcast. And let's finish with um, another one of your highlights, Ravi. Yeah, so this was a recent interview and it was just absolutely fantastic. And I think uh, you guys should all check this one out because uh, this is Lee Felsenstein and he played a central role in the development of the personal computer. He was um, a moderator of the Homebrew Computer Club and this club was basically where all the pioneers were meeting up. They had Steve Jobs there, they had a Steve Wozniak, you know... um, Bill Gates was running around at one point giving people letters. And uh, Lee actually developed the Soul 20 and the Osborne one as well. So this is a fantastic story about the kind of Berkeley free speech movement and the birth of computing, microcomputing in the world. There were several times when a lecturer that we, a lecturer that we had uh, arranged for, did not show up. For a period of time, someone was arranging half-hour lectures at the beginning of the meetings. And sometimes that person wouldn't show up. So what I would do was say, the topic of the lecture is such and such. Does anyone here know something about that? And about three hands would go up, and I would call on them, and they would recite what they they knew. And that would stimulate some more people to raise hands with qualifications and the yes, but. And, but, and here's this is another interesting thing. And by going through this process, the audience was able to generate as good a lecture as anyone could have generated. And of course, that tells you where that audience came from. These were not just Mm -hmm. random people off the street. This was people in the computer industry, most of whom by that time had not had the opportunity to have access to a computer, and uh, each of whom sort of holographically had a piece of the uh, puzzle. And we, we brought it together in those, those lectures. Very happy about those. But otherwise, there's, you know, it, it resolves to some quips. And uh, there was one point when Steve Jobs showed up. Um, 1976, they were finishing up the Apple I. Now, Wozniak had been there every meeting. He came in early with some high school students, Chris Espinosa, and uh, he would work on his Apple Basic. He would claim the only seat in the lecture hall which had an electrical outlet. And uh, I, who was always there, and he never spoke. In 1981, he introduced himself to me at a, at a uh, party and said, you, you probably don't recognize me, but my name's Steve Wozniak. Well, everyone knew who Steve Wozniak was in 1981. He said I was too shy to speak. Well, in 76, the spring of 76, Steve Jobs, whom I sort of recognized from Atari, was standing there behind Wozniak saying nothing. Uh, I remember thinking to myself, who is that rat-faced kid who's hanging around with Wozniak and not saying it? (laughs) And, well, when we broke up into the random access session, he came down where everybody poured out into the floor of the auditorium and began talking. He was running around frantically trying to listen in on every conversation. Uh, I think he, he attended maybe two meetings, and then there was the final, the meeting that where they brought the Apple One and introduced it outside in the lobby on the card table. And that was the event that wasn't very impressive at the time. I mean, yes, they had a little person, little computer, and yes, it did video, and that's nice. But I was, at that time, 
I had already developed the video display module, the VDM-1, using uh, shared memory, uh, which meant it would run as fast as the program would run. The video in the Apple One was uh, Wozniak's TV, TV typewriter. And that one could only put a character up on the screen every time the video sweep went around, that's 60 times a second. And so you really couldn't do graphics or anything on it. You could just display text. Now, I will claim that it's not a personal computer if you can't do high-speed video on it. And that's a controversial statement. I, nobody's ever proven that. But that's my claim. So with the video display module in 1975, which derived directly from the Tom Swift terminal design, uh, I had, I presented such video and computer games began to develop from that point. So that was the year 2020. Admittedly, in the rest of the world, and you know, for many of us in our personal life and career, a very challenging year. But I think looking back on the last, what, 50 episodes of the show that we've done, it's been probably my favourite year of this podcast we've ever and done. And you know, things are on the up. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling yeah. a bit positive, and I thought, you know, at the beginning of all of this, it wouldn't be. But um, things are definitely getting up, and also our guests are. We've already done a fantastic interview for next year. We have. And next week, you guys need to get some rest over the next couple of nights. Watch every YouTube video you can. Read every book about video games you can get your hand on. Because I've got a feeling this is going to be the most difficult retro super quiz. Oh, yeah. for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Five questions right out of 100 or something. <laughs> no, I'm sure it'll be. You'll, you'll breeze oh, it, Joe. You, you always win. Didn't you win last I year? I did, but um, pff, only because I had Ravi with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, oh yeah, I did. Yeah, oh my no, god, what am I on about? Yeah. yeah, I've never won, mate. <laughs> I'm so used to Ravi, only because I've knew with you with, with me, Dan. But oh god, we've got old quiz quiz wizard over here again, challenging us. <laughs> so, yeah, so next week it is. It's my favourite show that we do all That's year. That's because you always duck out. <laughs> <laughs> the one year that I did answer the questions, Joe just dragged me up and I won by default, you know, just by being on Joe's team. Uh, but yeah, next week it's going to be the Retro Hour annual Christmas Super Quiz. And every man for himself this year. So it's going to be Joe versus Ravi versus Neil from RMC and Paul Drury from Retro Gamer Magazine. Play along at home. Join us for that. And we will see you for more incredible guests in 2021.